I'm going to run the, the um, triumph of the will in the background. I'll talk about it at a certain point. Um, also, and I'll, I'll put up what we're going to discuss. Also, if you, found the, if you found the reading difficult, you weren't alone. I think everybody found it really, really hard. We were just talking about that. And Ian came up with this great idea of like thinking of the Super Bowl in relation to um, what he's describing in terms of expenditure and um, homogeneity. So that's kind of cool. So that might help. So what we're going to talk about, and we'll talk about that too. What we're going to talk about, we've got t four people presenting on it after break time. Um, I want to go through, or I want to go over the defining features of fascism. And then I want to talk about Wilhelm Reich's Mass Psychology of Fascism, which is about a 400-page book. Having said that, you might have enjoyed reading parts of it more than the Bataille because he's really clear. But I'll go over it. Then I want to talk about the three key concepts, really, in the article, homogeneous, heterogeneous, and sovereignty. And, and I'll also try and link these. It's pretty easy to do with um, Sagan's paranoid position and paranoia. And so I'm going to pull these down then, and I'm going to start this over. And this is on YouTube. Um, so if you don't, I mean, it's worth, it's one of those movies that's really worth also Man with a Movie Camera for a different reason, but I, not so much this one, but Man with a Movie Camera, this one too I have often looping in the background while I'm doing something else, just because there's some amazing images. I mean, Man with a Movie Camera is a uh, um, new Soviet society, Vertov, and they're both incredible filmmakers. So this is by Lenny uh, Riffenstahl. And what I'm going to do, though, is, as I said, I'm going to start with, I'm going to start with another work that was published the same year as Bataille's. Um, so when he published the psychological structure of fascism in 1933. So what you've got happening in Italy, 26, 28, and up, you've got the, the rise of Italian fascism. Um, what you've got happening in Germany is Hitler becomes chancellor in um, 33 and then uh, becomes head of state in 34. So you've got, and I'll, I'll go over that too. So he's writing this just, just as fascism, they're both writing it, just as fascism is taking over Europe or two countries in Europe. So Bataille is looking at Italy and he's looking at Germany and he's using his own theory which for people that just came in, really is a theory you'll find in most of his work. It, it is around expenditure and then the homogeneous and heterogeneous and uh, sovereignty or sovereign all of which he uses slightly differently. Not homogeneous, heterogeneous he uses slightly differently. But it's, it's um, fairly similar. But what I want to start with is Wilhelm Reich's work on the mass psychology of fascism. Because it was written the same year. And he makes a point that Bataille assumes. So the real core question, and it's coming out of, of Sagan as well, is the core question that both these works look at is why does fascism have mass appeal? That's, that's really why, I mean, we're talking about it and also Bataille nicely maps it onto the conscious and unconscious. But before we do that, I think what we need to do, and, and I only thought of this when I was writing the lecture yesterday, right? I was like, okay, so we really, or I really, because I'm responsible for it, need to put out some of the components of fascism so we know what we're talking about. So let's, I mean, basically I'll go through two different presentations of them. Um, in a nutshell, authoritarian nationalism, state-regulated economy, you've got, as you can see here, a aesthetic of what some writer has called romantic symbolism, using symbolism from the past and taking it, you can... I just want to see if the light will be better on the... 
Um, you can see this also happens in, um, you know, Soviet propaganda, actually. You have a mass mobilization, mass mobilization of the population. You've got a, a positive view of violence and a use of violence. There's this promotion of masculinity. There's a appeal to youth and a promotion of youth, and there is a charismatic leader. So authoritarian nationalism, state-regulated economy, this aesthetic, a political aesthetic of, of romantic symbolism that in um, Nazism goes back to Roman and Greek, or at least they try to. You've got mass mobilization. You've got this positive view of violence and use of violence. You've got a promotion of what I would even call hypermasculinity. You've got a youth culture, and you've got, it's really required, um, a charismatic leader. So to go back to Sagan for a second, in his threefold development sequence of the individual psyche and civilization, and for that, remember, it's paranoia, the paranoid position, and overcoming the paranoid position. In fascism, both the individual and the nation, or the individuals and the nation, have slipped from the paranoid position of a functioning or a almost functioning um, representative democracy back to, this is in the Italian and, and German um, situation, back to paranoia. I mean, it's, it, given um, Sagan's threefold division, it's pretty hard to have fascism operating in a country without a slippage into paranoia. Because if you're going to have a positive view of violence, if you're going to have the use of violence, if you're going to have romantic symbolism, mass mobilization, authoritarian nationalism, you pretty much need paranoia. It almost goes hand in hand. Now, there's this great piece online, and I'll tell you the name of it. Um, just because he says in a nutshell, which I've gone through, he, it's called What is Fascism? Some General Ideological Features, and it's by Matthew Lyons. Okay, so it's by Matthew Lyons, and it's, it's what is fascism. If you want to Google it right now, you'll see that what I'm going to say is kind of cribbed from there. And it's because he says it really well. The key points he makes, and he, and he provides one of the best summary definitions, right? So Matthew Lyons, what is fascism? Some general ideological features. What becomes really important in terms of the heterogeneous and homogeneous is it's both a social movement. It starts off as a social movement, so it starts off heterogeneous. And it's a system of rule. And when it becomes a system of rule, it becomes pretty homogeneous, expelling, you know, expelling those that don't fit, including in Hitler's case. A friend was reminding me yesterday about the, the uh, night, of long li night of Long Knives, where um, na the, the Nazi leadership killed off the SA because they were not fitting. They were too heterogeneous. They were too um, radical. They were also uh, a number of them who were out as... I guess you have to say homosexual because gay wasn't a term then, but they were out as homosexual. Um, so they got killed off. So they were, they were too heterogeneous for this homogeneous um, nationalism that was being formed. Fascism arose in the early 20th century, and it arose, and you should see somewhere on here, because I thought I saw it yesterday, um, it arose in response to really sort of rapid social upheaval. Devastation during World War I. In the case of Germany, loss of land. Um, an impoverished population. And fear of the Bolshevik Revolution. So you've got rapid social upheaval. You've got this devastation after World War I, particularly in Germany's case. And remember, Italy and Germany were on opposite sides in World War I. Um, I think. Am I wrong? No, yeah, they were. And also the Bolshevik Revolution. So you've got that operating. So it's a right-wing ideology, and it celebrates, I mean, fascism is going to celebrate the nation, and sometimes the nation and race, or nation or race, as what's known as organic community. That is like, as something that's completely homogeneous, an organic community. It rises, it rises up, it's unified, 
And this organic community that rises up from the ground is unified. It transcends all other loyalties. Thus making it completely homogeneous. There's usually a myth of you know, national rebirth, racial rebirth, after a period of decline or destruction. That's why we get a little worried when, you know, and it's not at all, I'm not by any means suggesting that Donald Trump is a fascist at all, okay? But he's going to make America great again. That, that sort of claim, that, that there's this emphasis of a, a renewal, a national rebirth after a period of decline and destruction. There's also this call, um, Lyon says, or Lyon says, for a spiritual revolution against moral decay. So the spiritual revolution is like cleaning up the cabarets in, in Berlin, for example. Um, cleaning up homose homosexuality, making the family really central. That sort of scene, that was a move against moral decay. And there's this move to purge alien forces and groups. Those that don't fit with the homogeneous program. So certainly in, in Nazi Germany, politicos, um, left-wing politicos, uh, gay people, lesbian people, Jews, um, Jehovah Witnesses, people that don't fit, anarchists. So if you, if you go to one of the memorials, you'll see all the badges that people that were incarcerated were forced to wear according to, according to the color of what group they were. So if you're an anarchist, you're wearing a black a black square, or a black triangle. Um, if you're gay, you're wearing pink. I mean, like I got, so they've, so you take a look at all the, the sort of badges, either as a, as a star or as a triangle, of, of triangles put together. So really this targeting of alien forces, you see that a lot more in Germany than you did in Italy, by the way. There was a real move to more integrate um, disenfranchised people in Italy. I mean, Italy, Italy had what people have called sort of a, a more sort of pure form of fascism that wasn't, that was nationalist, but wasn't so grounded in, in racism and genocide. So with, there's this purging, I'm just going for people that came in like you, um, I'm just going through the features of fascism before I start talking about the the um, articles, and I'm saying that there's a good piece online, Matthew Lyons' is What is Fascism? Some general ideological features that kind of sums it all up. So I went through points first, and then I, I kind of am going through this. Um, so there's this purging of alien forces and groups that threaten the organic community. That would be getting rid of all the heterogeneous. The heterogeneous is a very interesting category, because on the one hand, to come to rise, you need it. On the other hand, to become a strong power, you have to move to homogeneous with only the, with only the what's it called, the, the force of the heterogeneous keeping you there, right? So, so it's not something, once you're ruling, you want to have front and center. Fascism, of course, tends to celebrate masculinity. It tends to celebrate youth. It tends to celebrate mystical unity. And it tends to celebrate the regenerative power of violence. In the German example, it promoted racial superiority and ethnic persecution, genocide, also imperialist expansion. And if you take a look at fascist movements today, for example, which tend to, to not be so much one country but link internationally, it can also embrace a, embrace a form of internationalism which is usually based on ideological solidarity or racial solidarity across national boundaries. Now where fascism, and again particularly Italy, picked up the people, the mass, is it was populist. And one of the things you had happening in both Germany and Italy was a very sort of weak um, and falling apart in the case of Germany communist and the case of Italy competing socialist groups. So you had a you had an ineffectual left. So fascism's appeal to politics is populist. It wants to activate the people, bring together all the diverse people, the heterogeneous people, 
bring them together into a unity, thus becoming homogeneous. And it does so by pitting them against perceived, this goes right back to Sagan, perceived oppressors or enemies. You know, the outside and inside. So perceived aggressors and enemies, either outside or inside the nation, rallying them around this, making them paranoid of them. It's populist and it's elitist. It's both populist and elitist. By elitist, what happens is you take the homogeneous people's will, the populist people's will, and it's brought into elite leadership. It gets, it gets embodied in a select group, or, as is more often the case, one supreme leader then authority is going to pass down. So what you get is homo you've, you've got a homogeneity where authority is passing down, but the leader, not the people, once this happens, but the leader always maintains heterogeneous features, which we'll talk about. So fascism seeks to organize what, what um, is called at that time period, but we would just call a mass movement but a cadre led, that's a mass movement of the populace. So it, it seeks to organize this, which is heterogeneous. And it does so in a drive to seize state power. Once you've got state power, you move to homogeneous. That's how those two are acting, interacting. But in order to maintain the homogeneous, you've always got to have this force of the heterogeneous there. The aim then with fascism is to subordinate all fears, spheres of society to this organic community. And it's usually done so through a totalitarian state. So you want to like subordinate all aspects of society to an ideological vision of the organic community, you know, where the family is the small state, as a good example of, of um, what Hitler was talking about. And, and we will take a look at that in terms of um, Reich's argument. So the spheres, what you're doing in fascism is, is subordinating all other spheres of society to this vision of the organic community that's going to be brought to you, or brought through, the, through a totalitarian state. And by that, where the political, economic, and military are all one. So there's some def working definitions of fascism what I want to do now for people that just came in, I want to move to Reich's book on fascism, The Mass Psychology of Fascism, and then I'll go to uh, Bataille. And they were both written in 1933. So Reich, and, and years ago, I actually TA'd in this course in the 80s. Um, and years ago, the person teaching it, it was a full course then, did teach The Mass Psychology of, of Fascism, which is a very interesting book. It's like 400 pages. Um, I'm going to boil it down to about two pages of, of lecture notes, okay? And if you sometimes take a look at it, because what he's, what he's really asking is a question that, that had to be addressed, and that is, why did the masses turn to authoritarianism? Like, why do they do this? Why do mass, why does the populace turn to authoritarianism when ultimately it's going to be against their interests? So he's looking specifically, Reich is looking specifically at Germany between 28 and 33. And he's looking at the economic and ideological structure of the society. He calls Bolshevism, so remember as I said at the beginning, part of the rise of fascism was this fear of, of uh, Bolshevik revolution. So he calls Bolshevism red fascism. And he kind of groups the appeal, which you know, History didn't necessarily prove him so wrong. Um, he kind of groups the appeal under the same category as what happens in, in Nazism. Now, there's pretty big differences. However, they're both authoritarian, and that's what he's, he's going for. He makes this argument, and I think it's interesting because it draws in Freud. And I don't know what you think of the argument. Um, it takes him a long time to make it, which is one of the reasons I didn't put just a chapter of the book on. But he argues that the reason Nazism was chosen over communism in Germany 
was simply because, or was primarily because of sexual repression. You think, really? He argues, and this is right, he argues that as children, members of the proletariat, or members of the working class, or the masses, or whatever you want to call them, the populace, learned from their parents to suppress sexual desire. This is Freud. Suppressing sexual desire, then in adults, in a way makes them anxious around rebellious and sexual impulses. So he's saying if you, if you suppress sexual desire in children, their anxiety when they become adults is going to be around rebellion and around um, any sort of se sexual impulses. So he's saying that what the population had was a fear of revolt, as in revolution revolt, and a fear of sexuality. And that this fear arising from sexual repression, you got fear of revolt and fear of sexuality. So you've got this twofold um, anchoring in the character of the masses. And this, inter this produced what Reich would call the irrationality of the people. He argues basically, and this is a quote out of the book, suppression of the natural sexuality in the child, particularly of its genital sexuality. So I'm thinking there, he's probably referring to masturbation because 19th century, that's what Freud was referring to early of 20th century, that's what Freud was referring to. And if you read Foucault, that's pretty much what British laws were, were um, kind of imposed in schools against, right? So, he, so Reich is saying, and he's German, he's saying suppression of, the natural sexuali suppression of the natural sexuality in the child, particularly of its genital sexuality, makes the child apprehensive, shy, obedient, afraid of authority, good, and adjusted in the authoritarian sense. It paralyzes rebellious forces because any rebellion is laden with anxiety. So he's arguing, and I don't know if he's right or not, but I'm going to give you his argument. He's ar not so much for this, although it's kind of an interesting use of Freud, but for something he claims after this. Um, so he's saying that, that the sexual suppression and repression produces a general inhibition of thinking and of critical faculties. Thus, according to Reich, and this is what he says, in brief, the goal of sexual repression is, is that of producing an individual who's adjusted to the authoritarian order and who will submit to it in spite of misery and degradation. So he's using Freud to make this argument. Then, then it's where, so he says, the child first learns to submit to the smallest structure, to the miniature state, to the family. So the child learns to submit in the family. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> and then this prepares them for submission at the state level. The gen so you learn to submit in the family, and it makes it easier for you to be subordinated in the general authoritarian system. He also says, and I'll, I'll give you this, although we haven't talked about the primal scene, but I'll... And for a person that just came in, I'm just running through somebody else. I, I ran through the definitions of fascism. I'm running through Wilhelm Reich's key argument in the mass psychology of uh, fascism moving to Bataille, right? So he says that the symbolism of the swastika which, you know, I mean, you'll see a lot of that up there, so I don't have to draw it on the board. Um, the symbolism of the swastika evokes this fantasy of the primal horde, and I don't know how he gets that. The primal horde is the idea that you walk in on your parents having sex, or that you thought you walked in on them having sex, or that somewhere in your mind, you may have, you may not have, but it's the sort of the fear there. So, so in a sense... The Nazis systematically manipulated the unconscious. Now, I don't know where he's going with that. I think the symbol, the Nazi symbol, 
did in a way manipulate the unconscious. I'm not sure if it's in terms of the, this fantasy of the primal horde. Of, of, you could argue that it's desire not met, of having wanted to do this. I don't know. What Reich is claiming, a repressive family, a sadistic educational system, terrorism of the political party, economic violence, they serve to touch the individual's unconscious in terms of emotions, traumatic experiences, fantasies, and that, na and that Nazi political ideology really extended this and exploited these tendencies. So there was an exploitation of fear. There was an exploitation, oh, for good reason, of not standing out, because you'd probably be dead, um, at, a cert at a certain point, not 1933, but as it progressed. So, so Reich is looking ahead as is Bataille. And here's the, the paid dirt in here, I think, or the key point that I always found interesting in Reich. It's chapter five, and he talks about the family being the first cell of fascist society. It got him in lots of trouble. The whole book got him in lots of trouble. He had to get out of Germany, um, like really fast. And then he ended up, Reich didn't end up so well, because he, he then moved on. He got in America, and he came up with the or Oregon boxes. Oregon, Oregon boxes where you, you ha harness this energy force, which, you know, okay. I mean, it, New Age hasn't, hadn't really kicked off when he was doing this. Um, but so he was harnessing this solar energy and the energy of the body. And, it, you know, it was, like a, it was like this, you could, and then you could use it, you know, it enhance you. It was not one of his better, not one of his probably better moments. But what he says about the family is interesting, particularly in, in uh, Germany at the time. And he says, and this is chapter five in the Mass Psychology of Fascism. He says, from the standpoint of social development, the family is not the basis or cannot be considered the basis of the authoritarian state. But it is one of the most important institutions which supports it. It's a central, what he calls, reactionary germ cell. So you can see he wasn't very big on the family. And he, he says the family is the most important place of reproduction of reactionary and conservative individual being. His argument there is if you're repressed in the family, that if you, if sexual repression in the family is going to lead to fear of revolt, fear of sexuality, which is going to play right into a strong authoritarian state. That's where he's going with it. So he's saying that the conservative families and the, the sort of strong control of the children, if you want to take it out of sexual repression, the strong control of children um, then facilitates an authoritarian state. He says the family, quote, the family becomes the most important institution for, con for conservation, that it's of the conservative reactionary individual. And one of the reasons I wanted to sort of give you that passage is to lose and Guattari pick it up, um, in which you're going to read the chapter from them. And they talk about in the book, Anti-Oedipus, and we're not doing the whole book, of the, we, I have done this where we've done the whole book. They talk about the formation of fascism at the molecular level, like right in the body. That so control of the body and body responses and body movement in the family can produce, can lead towards authoritarian state structures. Yes, Ian, thank you. Um, but at some point, the Oedipal complex, doesn't it demand that you accept your father back as you know, your source of authority? Yeah. So, wouldn't, I mean, wouldn't like fascism really be the Oedipal complex? When sure. Sure, that fits, that fits great. That doesn't, and, and that doesn't, I mean, that's not contradicting Reich, you're just adding on to it. Oh, and that's yeah. Right? Yeah, because I mean, yeah. Yeah, Reich talks about that too. I mean, it, if you've got a strong father figure, what he's trying to argue, what Reich's trying to argue is that particularly in German families in that period, partly because of religion, partly due to religion as well, that you had a strong authoritarian family structure, which made it easy then to have a strong authoritarian state structure. 
Um, and the Oedipal example you gave works really well with that. So you accept your father back, and the state is the new father. And the, and the leader, the um, Führer, is the new father, or, or Duce in, in Italy. Italy didn't have the same sort of family structure. So, you know, Reich is making that argument specifically on Germany. I think, does that answer that or no? Yeah. I mean, it wasn't really a question. It was like a comment, right? Yeah, it's, it's, I'm surprised he didn't develop the Oedipal complex more. I think he does. He's got chapters on the Oedipal complex, if I remember correctly. What I wanted to touch on was this. So, I mean, if you take a look at the book, I'm sure, if I remember correctly, um, he's got like a specific chapter on the strong father and the strong leader. Because it's fairly, it, it becomes fairly obvious that you're replaying, but you, that, that because, I mean, the thing is though, what he's trying to stress is you're not, you, what you've got then is a fear of revolt and a fear of sexuality, so you're not going to overthrow the father the way a healthy Oedipal complex would be. Um, you're going to actually partially do it, maybe fail, and then become subject to the authoritarian state. It's like, Zig Heil is actually like a pledge of obedience to the leader, right? Right, yeah. It's like Absolutely. No, I mean, I think that's why Reich is going with this idea of the family producing like fear of revolt, fear of sexuality, and fear of replacing the father, in a sense. So you have a strong state father. But yeah, a father of the nation. I mean, I mean, Hitler wasn't the only leader to be term himself father of the people. That becomes one of those terms that leaders like to pick up. And usually that's an authoritarian leader. Franco was, very, uh, Franco was pretty problematic as well. And Franco did wipe out a population. Um, but Franco doesn't fall so much into the sort of fascism and Nazism that Bataille is describing. Um, I mean, he, I mean, he used, used the state structure, controlled the state structure, was an authoritarian leader, had the military completely in his power. So I was, I, I don't know if I said this before, but I was in uh, Spain when Franco died. Did I tell you guys that? No, 70, yeah, 75, 76. But one of the things you noticed immediately, immediately, like within like a week, all the police, the police force with the really weird hats and the machi submachine guns standing on corners and stuff were gone. And then they brought in a different, like, so they were, they were really sort of phased out. Um, there was a real fear there. They kept him on life supports for a very long time because they didn't want to lose the homogeneity of the, the society. So Frank is a good one to look at. You can also look at the Portuguese one, too, um, at around the same time period. The most extreme cases are, and the most, I guess, what? I, I want to put this in quotation marks. Charismatic leaders, and I'm not saying that in a positive way, are, are Mussolini and Hitler. And that's kind of what, that's what um, Bataille is looking at. Although I don't think he would argue that it didn't apply to, to Franco. Most of it applies to Franco. Well, so they stayed neutral for the, not until neutral for the Second World War. I mean, there was much, uh, there's a bland fascism. Franco would have been the version of it. Well, yeah, bland, and he did kill a lot of people. He, right. I mean, it's, but it wasn't as, Well, Franco was really, I mean, Franco was very strong in terms of unification, um, except for the Basque region. The Basque were having nothing of him, and he ended up killing a large part of that population, which I just happened to be in that region when he died, and it was like extreme party time. Um, which I, seriously, it was, uh, you know, I was like 19, um, and I was there with my ex-husband, and it was the streets, people were just partying his death. Um, and people, the soldiers, I mean, we, we rode, I don't even know how this happened, but we rode the train into Madrid to his funeral with the soldiers, which was one big party again. People were so glad he died because it was this whole idea of this repression being lifted. And the soldiers were the people that were supporting the state, and they were glad he died. So, you know, um, that was an interesting case. Yeah, Amanda? Can you give us some modern examples of fascism? Yeah, I was thinking we might do that in the tutorial.
and I was thinking, um, or in the, when you guys are presenting, if you've got one right now, we can go with it. If you want to put one out there. At different periods in time, yes. Currently. Uh, I don't know. That's touchy. It is. That's, That's a touchy one. Um, he's, it certainly has a lot of the features. Yep. Okay. Um, I don't. I actually. I would. I would hold off. I would hold back from calling Putin fa a fascist leader. Okay. Um, Yeah, um, that I, I'd be a little bit more comfortable with that, but I don't fully know. I mean, uh, let me let's go through what you need to have to be a fascist leader and see if that applies. I think it does. I think you could even I think you could even extend it to Putin. Actually, I you know so I think that you you can find lots of what information or material to do that um, in terms of uh, the charismatic leader. Father, state figure, symbolism. yeah, yeah. I think you could, but I, I for some reason, I just don't want to say that. I have trouble. I just, remember you could go back. Of, right. You could go back to that. Yeah, you could say that. They can, be, and there's a certain segment, and and there's also, you know, my friend also I was talking about because he did a, uh, he studied fascism for a while. He was like, don't forget, you know, like everybody thought Stalin was really great, um, up to a point. You know, and so I mean, this, that, that's what happens with not that you know, not that he's a Stalinist by any means, but that's what happens with leaders. The charismatic leaders are okay up to a point, but once you realize that point, you're stuck in the homogeneous. And so, you know, I mean, the point with Stalin is when he started collectivizing rural farms, if not before that, right, and just killing um, to change from killing farm owners to change from um, agriculture to uh, industry. It would probably be your first clue that you really had a problem if you were living there, right? And, and so the homogeneous, the, sorry, the heterogeneous is really tricky because it's what brings people together. And it's what gets the mass mobilization. And you've got this hope for the future, and then the future comes along, and it's homogeneous, and part of your population is often being killed. So, yeah, I mean, but I would be more than happy to go through. Yeah. Yeah, as a, um, as groups or no, or individuals. Like a person, like a defector, so journalists, yeah, journalists. Journalists, yeah. Okay, like I'm not. I was gonna say, if you've got groups, this sounds terrible. So I, I'm gonna back off on Putin. I don't want to say whether he's a fascist or not. I don't even know why, because um, it would be easy. But there's something that makes me think he's not. But I can't. I can't quite place it. And I've seen, or maybe it's just the West loves making fun of him, right? So maybe that's it. Um, you know, I've it's seen. Eh? It's hard not to do. But, I mean, his cult of masculinity, he's certainly kind of. hilarious. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, I think he'd like to be a fascist leader. He just can't. Okay, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with the wannabe. Yeah. Wannabe a fascist leader, no problem. Okay? Because, I mean,. Partly on the international scene, he's not. But okay, a wannabe. No problem there. Yeah. It's hard to say he's like a. Okay, shh, I can't hear the question. It's hard to say he's like a full fascist when, like, we're killing people in drone strikes, right? Say that again? It's hard to say that he's like a fascist when we're killing people in drone strikes. Fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. He's kind of using, like, the Constitution or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, once you start pointing out leaders that are fascist, there's, I think, going to be a long list of fascist behavior, if not fascist leadership. Were you going to say something or no? You know, not, not Ian. Uh, yeah. I was just wondering if Netanyahu would fascist. Could be. I mean, you've got a problem there again. Because on the one hand, he's got a... But he'd like one. <laughs> because he holds such a small fragment of yeah. the popular support. Because it's so fractured. There's no homogeneity. I mean, people look at Israel as homogenous. No, it's it not. Maybe the least homogenous. But he does. 
but he does have a Democrat. He is in a Democratic system, um, and he's always getting voted against. If you if you lose, okay, let me try this. If you're losing votes, regardless of what I was going to say, but if you take a look at some of his policies externally, you could say yes. But that is not just him. That's the that that would be the whole leadership. That would be the the um, representative government. So if you're if you're constantly losing votes in a, a vote on an action in, in Parliament, you're not, you're not a fascist leader. Although you could have fascist tendencies and particularly directed outward. So I think I, you'd probably have to go with that. Because if you're in a representative democracy, um, I'm not saying the democracy is behaving as maybe it should be, but you're not making those decisions as a sole leader. And people are not afraid of you to go against you. So that I wouldn't apply. I guess I would not apply it there as an elected representative. Yeah. Um, you mentioned like uh, state, reg state regulated economy, 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 so, yeah, and you're saying, well, when you're going to more and more sort of state-regulated economy or a tripartite system where you've got business, labor, and government running the economy, um, if you, you're not having, I was going to say, but York has a five-year plan. Um, so, what can I say? We're always coming up with a five-year plan that never works. Um, but I think that, that you, it's one component, but it's not... Like, it has to come together with all these other components. So, I mean, where, and I also don't want to say things about, like, you know, what's his name in Zimbabwe? Um, Mugabe. Mugabe. Um, I mean, he, I mean, again, you've got, like, a one party in power, or one person in power forever with people disappearing that disagree with him and et cetera, right? And you've got the military. You've got a good case there, and you've got a state-regulated economy that's just, like, suffering superinflation. Um, so, I mean, you could make, I guess you could make that claim. Yeah. I think I have a close example. It might not work, though. Um, how okay. about a theocracy in Iran? A theocracy in, in Iran. Iran. People from Baha'i religion, Jews, even Sunni Muslims don't have the same rights as Shia Muslims. Right. They're not getting killed, per se, but if you're a Baha'i, you can't go to university, you can't have your own business, and journalists or whoever can get killed or get killed. Go to jail. Okay. But it is a religious. Yeah, I was going to say it's. But it, there's a father figure, which is the supreme leader. Yeah. And there is a democracy, but at the end, it's the supreme leader's word that could veto anything. So I don't know if that would work. It might. I think there's. I don't know if I call it again. I don't know if I call it fascist. I would call it definitely authoritarian rule, authoritarian religious rule, mm -hmm. probably, um, where where certain segments of the population don't have the same rights as other segments to the point where people can't go back to Iran. Um, yeah, Ian. So, but globalization, wouldn't that be about the primacy of capital and remo removing a national identity? I mean, the whole idea is, is that capital is, is controlling, is by freeing capital, you take away the power of the state to really impose restrictions upon the economy. I mean, you have less and less control, so it's, it's actually anti-fascist. Well, it depends. It depends which, I mean, that's the ideal, but it depends how it plays out. What you've got a lot happening in globalization is, is states grabbing for certain parts of it but and so grabbing for certain deals. Well, but the 1%, you know, if the 1% is really, it, it's not a nationalist movement. Fair enough, it's yeah. A, it's a term that's primacy of capital. Yeah. Would that be anti-fascist? Um, it could be, it, but you could also, I'm not sure. I'm not sure because you, you've still got very, very strong nation states and you've got very, very strong leaders. Right, and so I think capital and national identity will always come into conflict but, to some mm -hmm. degree. Because you've got Venezuela where Chavez, who I think you could argue had elements of fascism, well, took over in Bataille would argue with some left. Of it. I mean, Bataille, one of the reasons I was using these was, was Bataille argues that some of the features of, 
of you know left and right overlap in terms of authoritarian rule. So you know he um, and Wright calls Bolshe uh, Bolshevism red fascism. So yeah, once you've got an authoritarian rule and you've got a disappearing population, which I don't think Chavez had, but I could be wrong, um, and you've got a planned economy and you've got a cult of leadership, you're you're somewhere on that continuum, right? Um, you've you've moved out, I guess, of the. I mean, Chavez is an interesting example because he didn't quite get to the point where he was. I mean, you start off being loved by the people, but then you start like persecuting aspects of the people. And I'm not sure Chavez had targeted any group that he was persecuting. But in, I think so, but you had an external enemy, which was sure. the United States. Absolutely, but that's a safe external enemy. Right, right? like that, that's almost just like, that nobody takes much offense at that. And so the level of violence in Venezuela right now is off is, the charts. Yeah. That Petrogen's forces are like yes. in control. But you don't have, you really don't have a very strong leader. What you've got is, now you don't know. no, you've got a heterogeneous forces have exploded again. And the question is, will they come together under a strong leader? And, or, and if they do, will that leader be able to hold them together? Because that's all in, in something homogeneous. I mean, that's a good example. Yeah. Sure. I just did for the first half of the whole lecture. Well, okay, so I'm going to go back to the very beginning of the lecture. Were you here or no? No. Okay, that's the reason. No, no, it's okay. I'll give people a refresher. So I started off and I did two different definitions of fascism. The first one would be mine. What do we know about fascism? Authoritarian nationalism, state regulated economy, a political aesthetic of romantic symbolism, mass mobilization, a positive view of violence and a use of violence, promotion of masculinity, youth and a charismatic leader. Okay, those would be them in a nutshell. And then I went on, so I mean those are, those, I mean you don't have to have all of them, but those are kind of the defining features that I would say are defining features of fascism. And I wanted to start with that so we kind of knew what we were talking about. But they, I mean, but it's good to it's good to refresh. Then I went to an article online, Matthew Lyons, who goes through some general um, ideological features of fascism, which you guys can look up. I kind of like summarized that too, and went through those in a bit more. And I think it's important. I, I mean, thank you for that because I think it's important to have all those features there, so you're not saying, okay, well, this. I mean, it's okay to say that, but but this country has aspects of it. But yeah, so I mean, that kind of clarifies it. So good. I'm going to go on to the Bataille. And Bataille, if you haven't read Bataille before, this is probably the most difficult article he's written. So, you know, good for you for reading it and good for the people that are presenting on it. Uh, what he is, and he's, he's also a novelist, right? I mean, he's an interesting, he's an interesting thinker. Um, and he worked in a library all his life, for example, as a librarian. So he's a philosopher of waste and excess. He's uh, what I would call a theorist of risk. And he wrote really a political economy of expenditure in response to Marxism and liberalism. So he wrote a political economy of excess saying it's not enough to look at production, you have to look at the excess. Fascism, one of the reasons the Wright Miller um, film is in the background is that I didn't want to pull pieces out of it for a film I was making on it because I figured that it's better to have the full, better to have the full film. Um, but it shows this sort of extreme expenditure, which is, which is what homogeneous, heterogeneous, and sovereign comes from in Bataille, the extreme expenditure that the Nazis put in terms of war, war force, and monument. So that's really, I mean, if you take nothing else sort of from the film, it's that she's able to capture this, this expenditure of excess in, in war, in war parades, in monuments, in um, you know, aesthetic symbols. Now, Bataille published The Psychological Structure of Fascism in two parts, in 33 and 34, in a communist journal called The Social Critique. And what you're seeing in, in terms of Triumph of the Will is a propaganda film by Lenny Riefenstahl showcasing 
the German chancellor and Nazi party leader at the 1934 Nuremberg rally, which took place over four days. And it's, what she did was she shot 60 hours of raw footage and she edited it. Now, to me, I mean, the film I think is remarkable um, in the way it captures these events on enormous scale and expenditure. And watching the film, you can kind of see how the heterogeneous populace would feel drawn to it, um, and you can see that they were drawn to it. Okay, So she really captures that. Um, she really captures the Nazi party's expenditure excess visually. So that like, how many years later? 30, she made it in 30, it, was, it came out in 35. So she shot it in 34. So 60, 70 some years later, 75 years later or more, you can still see it. What she's done is a technique. So you know, Hitler looks pretty big there, right? But we know that he wasn't big. Um, just saying, he also, he also looks really stupid, but um, <laughs> you know, but she shot him from below. Okay, so she shot him from below, so everything looks big. The, the, one of the other reasons I like this film is because really clearly when you're watching it, you go, they actually could never live up to their own propaganda. Right? They could actually never live up to what's presented here, and you think to yourself, interesting, was that what Reifenstahl was doing? You know, I don't know. So at the core of, but I thought it goes very well with Bataille, it's the same time period, and it's the famous Nuremberg rally. Um, at the core, and you can just see, the other thing is you can really see the move from heterogeneous to this homogeneous, homogeneous like mass of people all going past um, the, the parade site like um, saluting. You know, so at the core of Bataille, yeah, so Kush. Oh, she's an interesting case. Lenny did not give up. Um, she also lied a lot. Um, so she was on, she was part of the trials to see where she was during the, I shouldn't say she lied or not, I should cut that out, but, but she was, she was uh, part of the trials after the war. And so they, they, they did, couldn't find any collaboration. So she was never jailed. Um, they would present her with things like, you knew the top leadership and she would say, no I didn't and they'd show her like where she'd signed in with them and she'd say, no I didn't. And so she went on to make films. I mean, so she covered, she also covered um, Olympia, the 1936 Olympics, which is an amazing film. It's on YouTube. And then she covered the 66 Olympics in Berlin for Life magazine. She went on to shoot some really, I would say, kind of questionable documentary on, she like, I mean, partly Reifenstahl is fascinated with masculinity. So she went on to, is that still running? Yes, okay. She went on to shoot stuff on um, African tribes. So you can take a look at that. And then when she was in her 90s, and I've seen, I've seen both of them um, in theaters, but in her 90s she did underwater filming with her then husband, who was in his 30s. Um, but he was, I'm just going to say, and, and he was gay. He was out gay. So I was like, okay, you know, go figure. He was also a very good filmmaker. So, I mean, so she, she met, kind of endured. I mean, you know, the... Um, the, the, it's supposed to be a thousand year Reich, crumbled in about seven years, and Rothenstahl, who shot this, really endured longer and, you know, like forever, and actually influenced filmmaking quite a bit, you know. She's way more interesting than, her way of shooting it is more interesting than the Nazi party, in my, in my estimation. But she could really get, I think, both the heterogeneous that was going in there and then the, becoming homogenized into the leader. So what you've got at the core of Bataille's understanding of fascism is, is so he, he's really interested in the social superstructure and the economic infrastructure of fascism. And at the core of that are these two co uh, concepts, homogeneous and heterogeneous. He says he's Marxist. He says it goes without saying that a study of the superstructure, that is of the ideology, of religion, of politics, of the family, of culture for the superstructure, that a study of the superstructure presupposes the development of a Marxist analysis of the infrastructure. But you need to do a Marxist analysis of the economic. So he begins his analysis with which, what is most obvious. He begins with the homogeneous. Okay. 
And how does he describe it? Well, 122. The homogeneous is actually kind of interesting to describe. It's the same page as because it's taken right out of the reader. In the homogeneous, all elements become commensurable. So everything is measurable, commensurable. Human relations operate according to fixed rules, and these rules are known. Bataille says to bring in Freud, fixed rules are based on consciousness. It's your ego. You know these rules. You know the rules of the superego. The, the fixed rules are based on consciousness of them. Violence is excluded in the homogeneous. The basis of it is production. Now, he makes a distinction between the homogeneous, which is a productive, useful society, and the heterogeneous, which I'll get to in a minute. So the, so the homogeneous is productive, useful. Every useless element is excluded from the homogeneous part of society. So when Nazis came to power, what they started excluding were from, to create a homogeneous society was what they considered useless elements. That gets excluded. Every, he's writing in 33, so he doesn't know this yet. Every useless element is excluded from the homogeneous part of society. So in homogeneous, each part is useful to another. And money's the measure here. So he's using, Bataille's using a Marxist analysis of labor. If you read Bataille's other works, he, uh, he, he has his own analysis of political economy, but in terms of labor, he has a Marxist analysis of labor. He says, money serves to be the measure of all work, and he's critiquing this, and makes humans a function of measurable products. So it's basically like Marx in economic and philosophical manuscripts. Each man, according to the homogeneous um, view of society, and each woman, is worth what he produces. And if one is not producing, one is not useful, then he goes to Hegel. And he says that in a homogeneous society, one is not an existence for oneself. So you're not operating, let me write this down, you're not operating in a homogeneous society as an existence or existent for itself. Rather, your, your reason for being, you're simply an in itself if you've read Hegel, your reason for being is to, be an, is to live an existence for someone else, an existence for something other than yourself. That would be the boss, the worker, the owner. It's the owner, this is on 123, it's the owner that founds homogeneity. So face it, the heterogeneous elements are not going to want to found homogeneity. One twenty-three. The homogeneous part of society is made up of those men, and he says men, who own the means of production, or the money to keep the means of production running. So you say, what about workers? And what he says on one twenty-three is, and he makes a distinction between psychological and non-psychological. He says, and I'll come to you in a second, Ian. He says, the workers are integrated into the psychological homogeneity in terms of their behavior on the job. So you're integrated into it in terms of your behavior on the job, but not in general as humans. Outside the job, the worker, the laborer, is, he says man, I'll say human, is a human of another nature to the boss or to the bureaucrat. And I'm going to stop there because I have 15 seconds left until I have to change the... So I'll just stop. Ian, why don't you... I'm just going to change the um, tape operating as a, an existent for itself and workers as existence for somebody else. Okay, I think that's good. So anybody else on that? You guys got anything, the two people there? Yes. No, I'm, I'm with you. It's not easy, okay? Is the 
okay, you've actually, that's awesome. You've actually really got weight on the problem with the piece for Bataille. And that is that heterogeneity, he's very much in favor of heterogeneity. Okay, once heterogeneity is lost and it becomes homogeneous, which you get, which you get solidifying is an authoritarian ruler. There's problems with heterogeneity. It's a dual, con it's a, dual a two prong concept. There's problems with it as well. So, so everything that's, I mean, when you get to what a sovereign human being is, it's not, it's not this, how you would normally understand sovereign. But in this example there between the worker and the, the owner, the, the owner is sovereign because he's the one that has his life is in control, right? Bataille would come down definitely on the side of heterogeneity. Um, where he sees the problem, and, and where we should see the problem is, is how it gets articulated together and feeds into homogeneity. And then he also says, and I, I, I get what you're asking, because he also says when he talks about, when he talks about the um, um, king, for example, he's talking about a king or the leader, he says that, that he's going to contain or is going to hold on to some heterogeneity, even though the, the, everyone else has got imposed homogeneity. I mean, it can, to make it, I mean, we can even sort of make it, all he's really saying there is, look, fascism really relies on heterogeneous forces. It also relies on a force that is not going to be contained in homogeneity. Once in power, the state is going to be homogene homogeneous. The leader is going to have access to this heterogeneity. Okay, and that's kind of, that's kind of it in summary. Does that, does that make sense or no? Okay, thanks for that question because um, I'm, it was, I think it needed to be answered before we go on. Yeah, Ian. Didn't this go back to Bella, I think, when Freud story about not feeding a horse? I mean, like, so if you repress heterogeneity to the point that, I mean, some of it, so as you were repressing it, there should be sublimation if you're Freud. And there should be value achieved from that sublimation. But if you extinguish heterogeneity, doesn't the society cease to have that energy? Yeah, and that's why it's, and do you guys know where my glasses, can you see my glasses anywhere? I'm like, damn, this is going to be like, I'm now going to like try and remember what I wrote. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the problem is, and, and one of the things, one of the things Bataille is saying is heterogeneity is never, it, there's this force of heterogeneity that's never fully repressed. But on the other hand, once you're solidified as a state, what you've got is homogeneity. Um, and it's kind of like if you get to Lacan, it's kind of like the real always threatening to come through. But state atrophies without a sufficient amount of heterogeneity? Well, that, well without, yeah. And then it can, unless you've got a very strong ruler, and then you're going to find it coming up again, because he talks about, you know, he talks about what gives rise, to go back to your question, um, what gives, I don't know her name, but the woman beside you. Rand, okay, to go back to Rand's question. So what gives rise to heterogeneity is this is trophying homogeneity that happens in failed um, democratic systems. Failed democratic systems in the sense that they're not feeding their population. They're not, they're not remaking after the war, um, World War I. They're also not integrating veterans back into society. Part of the problem was when veterans returned in Italy, people were laughing at them. Right, so I mean, like that, there becomes a real problem there. So, so what you've got is a failed um, liberal democracy that's going to give rise to like heterogeneous forces. Can it also predict the failure of fascism, like Russia, in the seventies, eighties, by extinguishing heterogeneity to the extent that they they're able? It takes the dynamism away from society. That's interesting. That's a good observation. Because really, I mean, if you think about it for a couple of minutes, the heterogeneity, the homogeneity is kind of fitting together with the paranoid position and paranoia. And what happens, not as they map on each other, but what happens when you don't have a certain popular of your population that's heterogeneous. But when you have too much that's heterogeneous as well. So I'm going to, because I'm about half finished the lecture, and I want to finish it before the 1 o'clock or, or 10 after 1 break, just because we got four people presenting. Can I get the people here that are presenting? So you're presenting? 
Awesome, so you're all here. Okay, that's great. Um, so let me just go through this. Feel free to stop me again, but let me get, let me just get to a certain point here. So the state then, as I think I just ended saying, but I'm going to back up and say it again, the state is going to serve homogeneity. But it's precarious, and this is what Ian was, was just suggesting. Homogeneity is always precarious, and it's always subject to internal dissent or external violence. It's kind of similar to Sagan's paranoid position. If you're in a parliamentary democracy, and to go back to the example you were using in terms of Netanyahu, um, think what we might of it. It is a parliamentary democracy, so he is subject to compromise and consensus working out differences with those who are included in that democracy. Let me say that. Um, so in a parliamentary democracy, you, you work out differences by consensus, compromise, as we all know. One of the jobs, and this goes to Ian's question, one of the jobs of a state is to neutralize heterogeneous force. When homogeneity begins to fall apart is when a significant segment of, quote, this is 125, the mass of homogeneous individuals cease to have an interest in the conservation of the existing form of homogeneity. So you've got dissatisfied citizens. Now, what do you do in, for example, um, apartheid South Africa, where many of the people dissatisfied were, were not citizens, right? So, I mean, but we're, so you would say that you had a very heterogeneous system there that was about to be overthrown at any minute. Um, you have dissatisfied citizens any minute that lasted about 40 years because of state force. But you've got, you've got dissatisfied citizens that are going to split off and join heterogeneous forces that already exist or that they're going to come up in the organized state. And usually the catalyst is economic. What Bataille is saying is usually what's going to motivate people to act as a heterogeneous force is economic poverty. It could be political repression, but economic poverty and political repression often go hand in hand. Heterogeneous. So the big concept for Bataille is heterogeneous and sovereign. Heterogeneous are elements that are impossible to assimilate. And so once they're assimilated, they're homogeneous. They're often unknown. He talks about a heterogeneous force. If you take a look at this in terms of the conscious and unconscious, as Bataille does on page 126, the heterogeneous, in a sense, heterogeneous elements that are there present in the homogeneous realm of consciousness tend to correspond to the unconscious. He says the exclusion of heterogeneous elements from the homogeneous realm of consciousness to him recalls the exclusion of elements that are described in psychoanalysis that are, that are in the unconscious. That is, the unconscious's exclusion of repressed elements from coming to consciousness. Do you want me to take another run at that or do you get it? You got it? Okay. Yes. Another run at it. Yeah. All he's saying, I thought it was, uh, it's much, I need to sit over here. It's much, it's much less complex than that sentence is. He's saying that, look, the homogeneous operates like what's in our consciousness. All right? We know the rules we have to follow. We know what we have to do. It's all in our consciousness. The heterogeneous is like the unconscious. When, you, when you're in analysis and you talk about something that's in your unconscious and it comes up, it's like repressed. So the heterogeneous is like what is being repressed in our unconscious that will come up in consciousness and we may act out in a different way. So he's making that comparison between conscious or ego and heterogeneous or unconscious and id. So the unconscious is one part of the heterogeneous. It's not all of the heterogeneous, but it's one part of it. And the conscious corresponds as a part of the homogeneous. So he understands heterogeneity as elements that are impossible to assimilate. 
This is on page 127. He gives a really good definition there of 127. And then we get to effective relation, reactions, which are important. So Bataille says that the heterogeneous world includes everything resulting from unproductive expenditure. That is something that doesn't give you a use value. It consists of everything by homogeneous society as waste. And here's where it gets tricky. And this goes back to Ron's question. So it's everything that's, that's rejected by, by homogeneous society as waste and as having transcendent value. It's both. The, the trick on the heterogeneity is that the elements are both waste and, waste and disgusting, etc., and having superior transcendent value. You've got both of them. And that's, so it's a superior transcendent value that the leader is going to hang on to. While expelling, while expelling um, according to Bataille, the, the elements that, that in a sense are waste. So you've got these opposites. You know, the, the, you've got what's the homogeneous society has expelled as waste or considers waste and superior transcendent value. You've got these opposites playing out. Bataille includes in the heterogeneous the waste products of the body, persons, words, acts having erotic value, pornography, for example, the various unconscious processes such as dreams or neurosis. This is all heterogeneous. He would see that um, dream analysis, what's in dreams, is heterogeneous content. Also, elements of, or social forms that the homogeneous society can't assimilate. Things of mobs, the warrior, aristocratic classes, impoverished classes, bourgeois revolution, the aristocrats did not want to go with them. Um, impoverished classes, these are all part of the heterogeneous. Different types of violent individuals. People that refuse the rule. People who are mad. People who are leaders. He lumps madmen, leaders, and poets together. Okay? So people that refuse the rule. Now, did you have your hand up or no? no? Okay. Okay. So that's all heterogeneous. And here's the kicker there. He says it's the heterogeneous elements that really bring about effective reaction. You need these heterogeneous elements. You need to draw on them to bring up, to bring to the fore effective reaction. What you're seeing in, in um, Riffenstahl's movie is effective reaction. Effective reactions can be either attraction or repulsion. What they're trying to do there is attraction. But heterogeneous elements produce effective, as in affect, affect studies, um, emotional, irrational, strong reactions. And, and Triumph of the Will, the film, I think really shows that. So violence, excess, delirium, madness characterizes heterogeneous elements. In retrospect, we can take a look at this and say, OK, it's like a delirium, it's excess, it's madness, it looks rational at the homogeneous, homogeneous level, but there's something when you watch it, there's something that's really, even if you don't know anything about the outcome, there's something really unsettling about that, particularly, you know, the scene. The scene. So that, that's what Bataille, and Bataille's seeing, Bataille hasn't even seen this film. He's writing this in 33. This film was shot in 34 and came out in 35. So the heterogeneous elements, violence, excess, delirium, madness, occurs as a person and as a mob. And the aim, this is on which, page 127, the aim is to break the hegemony. Homogeneous elements, Bataille says, are defined elements, you know, rule of law, they're identified, they're solid. Heterogeneous reality, which is why effective reaction is so strong there, they are not solidified. They're basically force or shock. Reality is a force or shock, which is partly what you can see the uh, Nazi party picking up on there. The repetition of it 
makes it almost homogeneous. So he gives two examples then of, of heterogeneous elements. And this is where there's a bit of a slide, but he's pretty careful. The two fascist leaders, Hitler and Mussolini, they're heterogeneous. However, they are eventually going to make their followers homogeneous. So both Hitler and Mussolini, and this is about around 128, I think, they're really opposed to the meaninglessness of homogeneous society, the devastation. They're driven by a force, a heterogeneous force that's gonna, that disrupts the regular course of things. Laws are broken. These are, to go back to what I was saying before, these are the leaders see themselves as having transcendent value. Okay? Not as waste, but according to Bataille, they are tran have transcendent value in terms of the heterogeneous. He says, quote unquote, the force of a leader is analogous to that extended in hypnosis. So you've probably read stuff where you talk about leaders putting people in, a hypno like in hypnosis. Hitler has been accused of, of doing that. It's this effective flow, the effective reaction that, that kind of connects between leader and follower because of the leader's transcendent value. But Ty's careful to say he doesn't agree with this, by the way. I mean, he doesn't agree with this happening. He, he says how it happens, but he's not in favor of it. Um, and I'll read you that quote just in case you thought he was. So, so, so basically, you get this effective flow that's going to unite the leader with his followers. You get a moral identification of the followers with the leader. And the, un, the common consciousness becomes increasingly violent and excessive in energies. This, so the common consciousness, it's like something slips from the unconscious, this force, become excessively violent. There's excessive energies and powers that they accumulate in the leader. And through the leader, they become available in society. So the fact that you could have people standing at a rally, four days of rally, bringing the, the troops in, means precisely this happened with Hitler. That, that the effective flow that unites the leader with his followers, this moral identification of the follower with the leader and the leader with followers, is a function of a common consciousness coming up that is increasingly violent, has increasingly excessive energy, and it's going to accumulate in the person of the leader. And I would say he's manipulating it, or they're manipulating it. And through the leader, it's going to become wildly or widely available. Then he gives, he gives an, a definition of the heterogeneous in terms of a lower strata of society. And it's only briefly, he's, he says those are, it's the people who generally provoke repulsion and are not assimilated by the whole of mankind. And he goes to the caste system in India, and although he's not using the, uh, the Dalit is the uh, term chosen of resistance, uh, res of a, like for, mobilization from that position, the term chosen now. So he's going there. I'm not going to say Bataille knows all that much about India. I don't think he knows all that much about when he's talking about Islam. He's just using it as a sort of example. He's saying, OK, in the caste system, the lowest caste is seen as um, untouchable, repulsive. And he's saying that's one type of heterogeneous. He's contrasting that to what the leader who has transcendent value. Okay. So then he goes back to the sacredness. And he says there's a sacredness that maps onto the heterogeneous. That it's both sacred and profane. And sometimes, um, sometimes you have somebody who can embody both sacred and profane. And if they're able to do that, they have, they're, they're, uh, have quite an amazing position of power. It's usually a religious leader. So I was, you know, there's, there's some examples I can give. I, I probably won't. Um, 
But if you can combine the sacred and profane, then you've got both glory and dejection together. And it's stronger than either the sacred or the profane. But he's working with an identity of opposites there. So fascism in its rise belongs to the heterogeneous. And what you can see in the film is the rise and the homogeneity at the same time, right? So fascism in its rise, it's almost like she was able to capture, that Riffenstahl was able to capture both of those. In its rise, but not once it's established, belongs to the higher forms. Page 130. Heterogeneous fascist action belongs to the entire set of higher forms. It makes an appeal to sentiments traditionally defined as exalted and noble and tends to constitute authority as an unconditional principle situated above utilitarian judgment. Now he stresses right after that, he says, this use of the words higher, noble, exalted does not imply that he's endorsing it. He's saying this is what they use. That in its formative phase, fascism is using this. That's how it's articulating the heterogeneous elements and it's appealing to the unconscious. Then he takes a look at a monarch. He says, okay, well, it's not like this hasn't occurred in monarchy. That if you take a look at the political sovereignty of a monarch, what you've got is to begin with often sort of an orgy of blood and coming to power, a sadistic activity. But this isn't going to maintain a connection with homogeneous forms. That, this, that that has to happen next. So once they've come to power, what they're going to do, and he's looking at a, a monarch here, a constitutional monarch, um, but he's looking at a constitutional monarch as they've come to power. So, you know, they, they come to power, power in violence, and that's heterogeneous, and that's, that's sort of the orgy of blood. And once they're in power, they're going to have to exclude the heterogeneous to stay in power. Homogeneous society then excludes, once in power, every heterogeneous element, whether it's filthy or noble. But they're always there, like the unconscious, threatening to come through. And the, the king is dependent, if you're looking at a constitutional monarch, in terms of these forces, uh, managing these forces. So the leader, the king, is the object in which homogeneous society finds its reason for being, and they have to manage the heterogeneous forces. Maintaining this relationship, the king has to behave in such a way that homogeneous society can exist and that he's still above it. Because, as king, you're heterogeneous. And what he's trying to say there, and as an authoritarian leader, you're heterogeneous. So, the meaning of sovereign for Bataille. Yeah, I can do this in eight minutes. The meaning of sovereign for Bataille is different from the ordinary understanding of the term. You're only fully sovereign for Bataille if you're heterogeneous. The king is sovereign because of hanging on to the heterogeneous components of transcendent value. A leader is sovereign because of having these heterogeneous components. The sovereign for Bataille is, is what sovereign is in the domain of non-utility and non-objectivity. It's useless. It, dis, it, it disdains use. It scorns what he calls the bourgeois world of things. Yes. I mean, it's got a sacredness. It's, the, leader's, the leader's sovereignty is, I mean, the way he describes it in another writing is, it's that moment of being completely for yourself. He says that workers often only get this, and it's not in this reading, but I'll just run through it. The sovereign moment one gets when, he says, for workers, for ordinary people, it's like when you're having, a, I don't drink, but it's like when you're having a glass of wine. Um, and there's that moment where you're completely in the moment, you're not responsible for your job, you're not responsible for the other things, but it's a sovereign moment. It's got no use value, it's got no utility. Okay, can you guys not talk so loud? Or if you want to talk so loud, you can, like, okay. Um, 
So it's got, it's got no utility. It's, so for the common person, that's when it'll occur. You know, it's that moment where you're no longer part of the productive process, either in terms of your work, in terms of what you have to do to do your work. It's something outside of that. For the sovereign leader, it is always there. Because sovereignty is consumption. He can, the sovereign individual consumes and doesn't work. It's life beyond the limit. OK, again, can people not talk so loud? Or maybe even at all? Give me like so, about six minutes. I'll finish this. Then we can do a break. OK, so the sovereign um, is life beyond the limit. Homogeneous is all about the limit. It's about the ego, about consciousness, about superego. Life beyond the limit is heterogeneous. Only, we only experience it for moments. You might be able to experience it when you're working out, for example. But it's not experienced as a day, as, as a regular activity. So pure expenditure is not utility. It's the end of all activity. And sovereignty is life beyond utility. So how do you keep the heterogeneity of the king is the question. Well, you've got on the one hand, because of sacredness, you've got taboos of contact. But you've got to, if you're in a free state, where you've got an authoritarian ruler rather than king, the tie suggests that the way the heterogeneity of the king or the leader of the authoritarian ruler is held is through destructive passion. The destructive passion, what Freud would call thanatos, what Bataille is going to call expenditure. And the king keeps the heterogeneity by directing this destructive passion of the state, of the individuals in the state, either outward towards another nation or inward toward the impoverished classes. It's also what Sagan says. So they kind of come together there. So expenditure stands in opposition to the productive mode. Examples that Bataille gives of expenditure are like memorials, um, war machine, anything that that's, has no use value other than you know maybe bringing people into the homogeneous fold. But um, war, destruction, Monuments are all part of expenditure. So expenditure then is going to signal the triumph of waste over production. It's going, to, it's going to signal the triumph of waste over the principles of order and utility. So what you see happening there on the one hand in the film is all this order, regimented order and utility going on. And you've got just massive Massive production of waste in terms of monuments, in terms of banners, in terms of the war effort. Bataille argues that classical economics, including Marx, is only focused on production. And what he wants to focus on is the consumption, the expenditure. He's focusing on non-productive expenditure, unconditional expenditure. So I'm going to jump way ahead because there's a couple of other things I want to cover. When, what, I want to go back and talk a little bit about homogeneous and the cons, the idea of uniting and concentrating power. So fascism, to go to the German example, fascism signifies as a term uniting and concentration of power. So historically, uh, Hitler was appointed chancellor in 33, in 34, when this, after the death of Hindenburg, he becomes president. But he doesn't use the title of president. He prefers to be referred to as the Fuhrer and the, the Reichstag leader, chancellor. So he, he, wants to keep, he wants to keep himself a sort of outside of, as something above the homogeneous. He doesn't want the same title as the other leader. Now, I was going to draw your attention, and I will, but I won't read it. If you go to page 135, he talks about, and it's quite brilliant, 
he talks about human beings being incorporated into the army, but they're incorporated into the army as negated elements. So it's the bottom of page 135, if you want to take a look at it. And he's saying that basically, if you look at the negation of the individual, there are human beings incorporated into the army are but negated elements, negated with a kind of rage, a sadism manifest in the, the tone of each command, negated by the parade, by the uniform, by the geometric regularity of movement. And they're negated for the purpose of the leader. The, the chief or commander-in-chief is the imperative. It's that person, that entity, that man, is the incarnation of violent negation. So he's taking a look there at the, at the military. Now, I want to go just to the ending. So on the one hand, he also talks about religion, and he says that the military is not enough. The military, having the military back you as a heterogeneous authoritarian leader who wants to have a homogeneous society, that's not enough. You need something external. Okay? Not a, you need something bigger than yourself. Okay? Because the military is answerable to you. I mean, basically, their, their, their action is what you've got them doing. It. Their action is their negation of, of life for you. So you need something bigger, and what you need is religion. The authoritarian leader needs to have sort of like the, the presence of, of a religious commitment to them. That religion and military and fascism can't be separated. And to go back to, I think it was Ron's question, Ron's question, the imperative presence of the leader is going to negate in order for them to stay leader, they're going to have to negate this enthusiasm, the energy that he's of heterogeneity that he's tapped into to get there. On the one hand, there are the people, the nation, that are identified with the fascist formation and the leader, and this is the heterogeneous, and this is sovereign. On the other hand, for it to work, there's the state. And the state is the unifying force. It's manifest, it materializes. So Mussolini, he quotes Mussolini on this. So Mussolini says that everything in the state, sorry, everything is the state. Nothing human or spiritual exists outside the state. So I'm going to back up and just do that one for a second again. So on the one hand, what you've got are the people, the nation, that are identifying with, with fascist formation and the leader. This is heterogeneous and sovereign. On the other hand, and you need both. Um, on the other hand, you've got the unifying force, which is the state. And everything is in the state. That's homogeneous. So he, Bataille uses Mussolini's quote there, everything is in the state. Nothing human or spiritual exists outside the state. That's page 140. Now, Mussolini, Duce, leader, Hitler, Fuhrer, leader, derive their fundamental power not from their official function in the state. That's homogeneous. This is what other prime ministers do when... So this is what a regular prime minister would do. That's why Hitler did not want to be called president, probably. But they derive their position from the existence of a fascist party and the position as head of it. A position that's based on them having heterogene being heterogeneous above the law and making the laws and not answerable to anyone and having a religious mystique and having sovereignty. Heterogeneous factors and forces come into play only when the homogeneity of society, that's the apparatus of production, comes apart due to internal contradictions or external contradictions. And let me just end. Um, I think, let me just end with this. So when you've got, when you've got the homogeneous society coming apart, 143, what happens 
And then I'll end with that. So when you've got the homogeneous society coming apart, you've got to move towards heterogeneous um, factors and force in terms of mass mobilization or other heterogeneous factors which could be more elite. You don't go for the elite as a ruler. You go for the mass mobilization. Um, you then articulate them to your cause. And he says, basically he says, look, the, the upper class or the leaders are not involved in movement. He says on page 143, only the lower part formed by the impoverished and oppressed classes is capable of entering into movement. While the others may have heterogeneous components, they're not going to they're not going to be capable of, moving in, of entering into movement, and movement is what is going to bring about change. Entering into movement represents a profound change in nature, from passivity to activity, so it goes back to Hegel, for becoming an existent for itself. So from a passive and diffuse state, mental state to a conscious action, The heterogeneous imperative in republican forms or constitutional monarchies usually ends up a trophy. So in a democratic society, unless it's involved in war, the heterogeneous imperative, that is, this, this spark that's going to ignite enthusiasm, tends to be a trophy. Where you see it coming up, in a sense, is during elections. You can see in the U.S. right now, um, in a representative government, you can see it happening there. But post-World War I in Italy and Germany, the economy is falling apart. Poverty, you've got veterans not integrated back into society, no order, there's a loss of national prestige, there's a loss of land in the case of Germany. You've got two competing revolutionary forces on the ground, communist or socialist and um, burgeoning fascist. They're both hostile to each other and they're hostile to the established order. Germany, you've got communists and the German National Socialist Workers' Party, which is the Nazis. Italy, it was socialists of various kinds and fascists. You will also have happening that fascists, Italian fascists and German Nazis or Nazis take and integrate working class and socialist symbols and ideas. So really what Bataille is trying to say is why, and he poses at the beginning, why is it they came to power and not socialist or um, communist parties. And we'll end it there. You guys deserve, can have a much deserved break. Um, it's 1.10. Can you be back at 1.20? And we'll start doing the question.